Hello, my name is Tommy and welcome to this presentation about the a priori algorithm. I'm going to talk about association rule learning, which is the problem that the algorithm attempts to solve. I'm going to talk about the algorithm in itself and its implementation. You can download this presentation from the link given in the description, which is also displayed on the screen currently. I'm going to talk about the problem which is learning association rules. I'm going to motivate it with a, with a few simple examples. I'm going to talk about uh, a solution to the problem, the a priori algorithm. There are other algorithms, but the a priori algorithm is a reasonably simple and popular solution to the problem. I'm going to talk about a practical matter, which is writing a Python implementation of this algorithm, which is how I kind of got into it. I, I learned about this algorithm in school uh, at university, not sure if I completely understood it, but then someone asked a question in a forum about the algorithm in Python. I looked at the implementations and I didn't think they were that impressive, so I read the article and I implemented it myself. And I'll give you a link to my implementation. Uh, it's in the description, I'll talk about it in this video as well. So let's talk about the problem first. And the example that's always given when it comes to the a priori algorithm is this uh, example from a supermarket. So you have people buying different products and each row here represents a customer and they buy some products. And we want to learn some interesting information, some structure from this data. For instance, the item set bacon and bread and bacon and eggs both occur often in these transactions. Bacon and bread occurs three times, while bacon and eggs occurs twice. We're also looking for these rules. Bread implies bacon, which is meaningful because the probability of bacon given bread is one, meaning everywhere you find bread, you'll also find bacon. So it seems like when people buy bread, they're also inclined to buy some bacon. And this is useful because if you know what, what kind of combinations people buy, then you can stock your supermarket and you can group together products and you can make ads and do all these interesting things. So it's, it's a good example. More formally, you have this notion of a database and you have items and you want to learn meaningful rules. And to do so, you need a measure of the meaningfulness of, of association rules. And we're going to talk about two things, uh, the meaningfulness of item sets, um, often um, uh, computed as support, and the meaningfulness of association rules, which is the confidence, typically. Let's look at support, support first. So if you have an association rule, x implies y, then the support is simply the frequency of which these items appear together in the database. There's no reason to really talk about the difference between the support of a rule and the support of the items. It's the same thing. And an important property that you'll see almost immediately is that the support of, uh, in this example, eggs and bacon must be smaller or equal to the support of bacon. Because while people buy bacon, for instance, 10 times, they can't buy eggs and bacon more often than they buy bacon. If you add eggs, then you probably have like seven people buying it, eggs and bacon, while you have 10 people buying bacon. So you can really only decrease, um, or it cannot increase as you add more items, which makes sense. So more formally, we call this the downward closure property of sets. And it simply states that if, if small s is a subset of capital S, then the support of small s is greater than or equal to the support of s. So if you add more stuff, then the support cannot increase. It must decrease or it must be the same. So this defines a measure of the meaningfulness of, um, of item sets. Let's talk about the confidence. The confidence of x implies y is the probability of y given x. And you can compute it using this formula, the probability of x and y divided by the probability of x, which is the support of x implies y divided by the support of x. And there's also an interesting downward closure property when it comes to confidence. 
which is that the confidence of AB implies C will always be greater than or equal to A implies BC. If you plug this into the definition, you'll see that the <coughs> numerator is identical. You have A, B and C, but the support is so that it support in, in the denominator is different. And using the, the, the uh, previous downward closure property, we see that um, that if you if you move stuff to the right, if you have a b and you move the b to the right hand side of the rule, then the confidence will always decrease. So more formally, you have this downward closure property of association rules. And it's really just based on the same thing as the downward closure property of support. Okay, so we have these two uh, notions of meaningfulness now. Here's an example. We look at uh, the transactions that we saw previously. The rule bread implies bacon has support three out of four because the items bread and bacon, uh, they occur together three out of four times. Bread and bacon is found in the first transaction. It's not found in the second transaction. In the third, it's found. And in the fourth, it's found. The confidence is one because when when bread appears, bacon also appears in every every case. Now we can construct this naive algorithm. This is not the a priori algorithm, but it is an algorithm that solves the problem. You could for every um, for every k from one to the number of distinct items that you have in your supermarket, you could construct every subset. So you start with subsets of size one, then of size two, and so forth, and you just enumerate everything. And then for every possible split of that subset, you make a rule x implies y. And you could compute the support and confidence of that rule. And then you could sort them by by uh, by confidence, and you could get get out the meaningful rules. And this is a great starting point because it's a simple algorithm. It clearly terminates. There's no black magic here. It's, it's really simple to understand and will work on small cases. But it's going to be very slow if you have a lot of data. And typically in these applications, you have a lot of data. If you have a supermarket, you have probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens, of millions of transactions. So computing every subset and checking every possible combination is going to be too slow. And this is a nice introduction uh, to the a priori algorithm, which solved this solves this problem more efficiently. The algorithm splits the problem into two phases. And in some expositions, you'll only see um, talk of the first phase. And I'm going to focus on the first phase in this presentation too, because the second phase, the algorithm is a bit more tricky, but you can go look up my implementation, you can read the paper and figure it out. But typically, people focus on the, on the first phase. For the first phase, a user specifies a minimum support for item sets, and the algorithm exploits the downward closure property by first checking uh, item sets of size one, and only checking item sets of size two, if if both of the subsets are uh, already above the threshold for minimum support. So this means you have this nice bottom up approach where you don't have to check everything, you only check a set, if all of its subsets are contained in what's already found. In phase two, you have your item sets and you want to generate some rules. So then a user specifies a minimum confidence and you apply this downward closure property of, um, of the confidence to, to check for rules where you, you gradually move stuff over to the right hand side of the rule. You start with everything on the left hand side and then you move things over to the right hand side. And you know by this property that you don't have to check every possible combination. So that's how it works um, with the two phases. Let's look at phase one first. For instance, here, let's start with a minimum confidence of 50%. And then we generate every 
items uh, item set of size one and the ones that have the desired confidence are bacon bread and eggs because they're found in more than or equal to half of the transactions these are called the large item sets of size one they're of size one so that's not why they're large they're large because they occur often in the transactions and from these uh, three we can uh, form combinations so again it's a bottom-up approach and you you generate these candidate item sets of size 2 we don't know if they occur with uh, confidence 50% yet so we actually have to check that bacon and bread and bacon and eggs and bread and eggs occur uh, at least in half the transaction so you do that and you figure out that bacon and bread and bacon and eggs both occur in more than 50% of the transactions. So then you have your large item sets of size two. If this example was larger, you would uh, keep going. You would create candidates for size three, and then you would create large item sets of, of size three, and then you keep going and, and uh, make larger and larger item sets. Let's look at a different example here with some uh, uh, numbers so we have these four transactions they don't have to contain the same amount of, uh, of items and we run the algorithm again with minimum support 50 percent the candidates of size one are all the possible uh, items of size one the large item sets are one two three and four because for instance five doesn't appear in, in half the transactions. While four does, it appears in three out of four transactions, so more than 50%. Now you generate the um, uh, candidate item sets of size two. And here you have all these candidates, one, two, one, three, one, four, and so forth. And they're, they're created from these previous large item sets of size one. And then you loop over your transactions and you check whether these are subsets in more than 50% of the transactions. And if they are, they're put into this list of, of large item sets. Candidates of size three, there's only one, one, two, and four. And if you actually count how often that this occurs, you'll see that it occurs in the first and the last transactions transaction. So uh, you have support 50% and you include this as a large item set of size three. Here's a sketch of the algorithm. You create a set of large item sets of size one. And then as long as you have some item sets, you create candidate sets that are one, uh, one size larger. And then you prune these candidates. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then you go over every transaction and you count the occurrences. You count how many times the subset appears in each uh, set of set or row of the transactions. And when you look at the code, this, um, sorry, this for every transaction, this is where the runtime is high because here you have to go through a lot of transactions and you have to figure out if you have subsets of, of these sets. So if you have 100,000 transactions, you're gonna to have to loop through those 100,000 transactions many, many times. And this is where all the time is spent in the algorithm. So you really want to minimize it. Um, and you do so by pruning candidates cleverly. So there are a few optimizations you have to prune, as I, as I mentioned, and you have to choose good data structures because you're checking for subsets in sets, and you, if you do that naively, it's going to cost you a lot of computational time. So I'm going to talk about those two things a little bit now. Let's look at these two lines. Create every candidate set of one size larger from the previous uh, size, and then you prune the candidates. Here's what it means. This example is taken directly from uh, the referenced paper, the original paper. So you have some um, large item sets of size three. Now, a really, really dumb thing to do would just be to create every, um, every naive candidate of length four. And this is horrible because if you, if you check if, if 
all of these five occur in the transactions, it's going to cost you a lot of time. Now, the algorithm a priori gen that's in the paper and it's in my implementation, it creates these two candidates and it does so by using the fact that the item sets of size three are sorted. So if you look at the first two, one, two, three, and one, two, four, you see that you can uh, align one and two from both of these item sets and you can put three and four next to each other and that's a candidate. You can do the same with the third and fourth, one, three, uh, four here and one, three, five here. You align one and three and then you take four and five. So then you, you create these two candidates. And you prune these candidates because you have to check that every subset here is in this set. And this is using the downward, downward closure property. So this one is kept because every subset is found among these, while this one is discarded because the subset 135 is not among... Ugh. 135 is not among... It, there's an error here, sorry. It should be 145. Um, yeah, 145 is not among the large item sets of size 3. Sorry. The next one is uh, checking subsets. So these two lines for every transaction go through and count occurrences. This can be really slow if you do it naively. So if you have these two sets and you check if each one of these is among these elements, if you do this by a double for loop, then the, the computational complexity is the size of A times the size of B. Because for this one, you have to potentially check all of these. For this one, you have to potentially check all of these. And for the third one, you have to do the same thing. So you're going to get a three times six um, operations, 18 operations, which is very slow. A better approach is to keep them both sorted and use binary search. So for instance, if you're looking for one, you want to see if one here exists in B, you could start in the middle and then you could use the fact that this is sorted, move to the left, and then you can uh, reduce the runtime significantly to the size of A times the logarithm base two of the size of B. But there's an even better trick and that's using hash tables. And this is implemented, implemented in the Python language uh, as the set method is subset. And this brings the computational complexity down to um, uh, the number of elements in A, the one that you want to check if it's a subset of B. So this is three operations. So it's a lot faster and you, and you really have to do this if, if you want to speed things up. So if you're interested in how this work, uh, please go and just look at, at um, I read about hash tables. Okay, let's talk about phase two of the algorithm, which is building association rules. Now we have frequent item sets. We, we know which item sets that are frequent, um, that have a minimum support, and we want to figure out which rules have confidence above our threshold. And essentially, this is what you do. If you have these items and you want to make rules, then you, you try and move each one of these items over to the right hand side. And then for each of these, you compute the confidence. Assume that only these two had high enough confidence. Then the only one that's really worth trying is this combination, AC implies BD. And this is a direct result of the downward closure property. But the algorithm for phase two is a bit more difficult to, to implement and, and to get it right. And typically, this is not where you would spend a lot of runtime. If you implement an Eve algorithm here, it's, it's probably going to work just fine. But if you want to do this cleverly, it's, it's a bit of work. So I'm not going to go into all the details. But I'll, I'll give you my implementation. And you, you can go there and you can look at the code. And it has a lot of comments. And you can read through it. I want to show you how the a priori algorithm runs on real data. This is a data set with 
approximately 32,000 rows. It's called the adult data set and you can find it here from this URL. And it contains information about education, marital status, relationship, race, sex, income, and age. Age is a continuous variable um, in the, or it's uh, an integer, but it's ordered. So maybe continuous is not the right word, but it's not, it's not categorical in the sense that there's an ordering to this thing. But I grouped it into three ages, old, young, and middle age, just to, just to make it simpler to work with this algorithm. So if I run this through my implementation, it runs in a few seconds, and it spits out information like this. Some rules are just really trivial, like husband implies male. Um, if you earn less than fifty fifty thousand dollars and you're a husband, then it implies you're a male. Obvious. And some are a bit more interesting, such as if you're a high school graduate, then that implies that you make less than $50,000. If you make um, little money and you're young, then, it, then it, uh, it implies that you're never married. So it's interesting. You can support, uh, you can sort these rules um, measured by confidence, lift and conviction, which are different ways to measure the meaningfulness. But when you run the algorithm, you, use, you provide a threshold for confidence. But you can afterwards sort them by lift and conviction. And if you want to know what that is, you just Google, um, Google it and you'll find the Wikipedia article. I want to talk a little bit about writing a Python implementation, because that's how I learned this stuff and how I kind of got into it. And I'll keep this very short, but I think it might be interesting to, to hear about. When I write code like this, I typically start by just writing some simple functions, such as pruning and generating larger item sets, uh, candidates of length k plus one, one when I have the set of k length item sets. So I kind of structure everything into functions first. And then if those functions are simple building blocks, I'll add some tests and check that things work. And then there's a lot of value in implementing a naive but correct algorithm. So you implement a naive algorithm that will work for um, small instances, and you can use this to test your fast algorithm against. So you have a benchmark and you have something that's easy to read and easy to understand, but very inefficient in this case. Then I typically implement a faster algorithm and I test those two against each other, for instance, by generating random inputs and I check that the result is the same and I run that a thousand times. And it kind of gives me confidence that my fast implementation is, is correct as well. Because when you have fast code, optimized code, it's typically harder to read. So there's definitely a trade off. In the end, I like to optimize by profiling the code. And I use Python commands and I figure out which lines are slow. And I look <clears throat> and see if there's anything I can do to speed it up. So Basically, the workflow is kind of like this. First, I try to understand the problem. And here it really helps to use pen and paper and, and uh, work through some examples by hand. A lot of people skip this and try to, to implement a fast algorithm um, initially. And it typically backfires because you spend a lot of time um, where you have potentially not understood the, the problem. So use pen and paper and try to really understand it, then implement a naive algorithm, implement the fast algorithm, and then look for bottlenecks in the code, measure, and then try to optimize those while keeping the code readable and, and with comments. You can add some tests. This is important. Uh, I have added some tests in my implementation, unit tests, just test known cases. And then you can do property tests, for instance, testing um, some property of your algorithm, or you can uh, test two versions, a slow and fast one. And you can also test about it against examples on Wikipedia and R, and this is just a test that you understood. So I generated some inputs and tested against the A rules package in R, which I, I trust to be a proper implementation. 
So this is the structure of my package, which you can find in this URL at the bottom. There is phase one and phase two, and some of these functions are um, named uh, as the ones in the paper. So they have the same name, which would make it easy to understand if you're reading the paper. And uh, an error here denotes that a function calls another function. So these are the functions that I used. To summarize, the a priori algorithm discovers frequent item sets in phase one and meaningful association rules in phase two. Both phases employ this bottom-up algorithm, which makes it fast. And they use the downward closure property of item sets and uh, association rules, where you specify this minimum threshold for support and confidence. My Python implementation is called efficient a priori. It's just an implementation as presented in the paper. It's not more efficient than that. The reason why I call it efficient is because I found that some of the existing uh, implementations were not as efficient as they should be. I uh, suggest reading the original paper if you want to learn more about the details. And you should be aware that there are other uh, algorithms which also find association rules that are arguably more modern and better. My implementation in Python will work if you have transactions ranging up to a couple of hundred thousand, maybe a million, depending on your uh, thresholds for support and confidence. But if you have 10 million transactions or 100 million, then you should consult more specialized implementations. I'll quickly show you some stuff online. The uh, Wikipedia article on the a priori algorithm is good and it includes an example, several examples. There's also a page on association rule learning where they talk about uh, confidence, lift and conviction, which are these measures of the meaningfulness of rules. It's worth looking at. My implementation is found here on GitHub, and I'll put a link in the description. And you install it by just typing this in your terminal. And there's an example of how you use it here. And there's more examples down here. This is the original paper. And I'll also put a link to this in the description. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was interesting and that you learned a little bit about the a priori algorithm and association rule learning. Thank you.